Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Chronicles of Aguna podcast brought to you by AMS Media with me, Harry Simeon, and I'm delighted to be joined by a very, very special guest on this edition. It's the king of Arsenal analysis himself. It's a man who represented the club and someone that I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's the brilliant Adrian Clark. Welcome to the show, mate. How are you? Hello, Harry. What a build-up. I'm not sure I can live up to that, but now very, very kind of you to say. Um, yeah, I'm all right. I'm fine. Um, but obviously, the world is is a very unusual place at the moment. So, um, yeah, still in a slight state of shock that, that everything is grinding to a halt. But, but yeah, nice distraction to talk to you, mate. Absolutely. We're looking forward to it as well. And, and we put a tweet out a couple of days ago saying that we were going to do this and the, the response has been fantastic. Lots of people saying um, they can't wait to hear it. And we've got a couple of questions as well, which I'll be throwing at you a little bit later on. But before we go on to discuss Arsenal, which is what most of our listeners want to hear about, it would be wrong not to touch on what's going on in the world at the moment. And of course, the world of football, which has come to a complete standstill. And as frustrating as that is for those of us who spend most of our time watching football or working in football, it was, in my opinion, absolutely the right decision to suspend the Premier League and the EFL. In the event, though, Adrian, and I want to get your thoughts on this, that it cannot continue, we cannot play out the rest of the season. What's the fairest thing to do, in your opinion? Is it to, to void the season? Is it to make Liverpool the champions? Because this seems to be an ongoing debate amongst football fans all over the country. Mm. Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's a, it's a hot topic, that's for sure. I'm very clear on this in that... I think the season has to be completed no matter what because the most important season has to be this season, the one that we're more than three quarters of the way through. If next season needs to be shortened, if we need to play one another once or cut out the FA Cup, the League Cup, slim down the Champions League, Europa League, so be it. I just think... in. To, to maintain the integrity of, of the sport, of the league, and just fairness in general, I think that whenever we're in a position to carry on, we should carry on. And and whether that is in June, July, August, even later, so what? If we, if we have to start the, the, the next season, the 2020-21 campaign in November, for example, let's do it. Let, let's find a way to make that work. I don't see how any other plan works. Absolutely no to null and void. I mean, anyone, anyone that is, is coming up with that one, I think has to be, you know, uh, putting self-interest first. Um, the only way, and, and I would be dead against it, the only other way if we were to stop is to go average points per game, I guess, because obviously not all the teams are on, on the same amount of points and you, and you class that as the, as the finish point. But I would, I would absolutely hate to see that for me you have to wait for this season to, to be concluded properly it might mean a few of the games are played behind closed doors but yep. that if that's the sacrifice we have to make to get it done then I think it's worth it yeah I agree with you entirely I mean when you look at for example let's let's take Liverpool as the prime example they've waited 30 years for a Premier League title they're on the verge of doing that, of achieving that. And for somebody to come along and say, actually, that's void because of what's happened would be devastating. You look at Leeds United, who have been mm. looking to get back into the Premier League since 2004. They're on the verge of doing that. And then to take that away from them would be it would be disastrous from their perspective. So All across the leagues, Harry, isn't it? Agreed, you know, they've, yeah. They've worked so hard to get themselves into positions. And yeah, it would be cruel to, to rob them of it. I just, yeah, I think we have to find a way, a solution to 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 conclude it. But yeah, it's sadly it looks like it's going to be a, a drawn out process, which is just you know so unexpected. But but we've got to deal with it, haven't we? Agreed, agreed. It's just one of those things, isn't it? Nobody could have planned for this. Nobody could have expected this. And primarily, above everything else, above even the game of football, which at times feels like life and death, but in actual actual fact, it's not. It is a no. game. It is a sport. And, and public safety obviously has to come first. Let's talk about Arsenal. Now, Mikel Arteta took the job um, in December. I was very much on the side of the fence that I wanted Unai Emery to go um, for, for quite a while and probably quite a lot earlier than a lot of other people. And I got a lot of criticism on social media, um, <laughs> on some of the, the channels that I've been on and, and some of the work I've been doing for 
I guess making the point that I never really saw what direction Unai Emery was trying to take Arsenal in. When he first came in, we saw, you know, a, a higher intensity. We saw different formations. We saw a, a plan. But for me, that kind of went by the wayside. I don't know if he felt that he needed to adapt in order to achieve his goals. But I just felt like the vision was unclear. He eventually, in my view, lost the dressing room as well. And Mikel Arteta's come in and he's been a real breath of fresh air. What have you made of the opening few months of Mikel Arteta's tenure? I've really enjoyed it. Um, obviously, not every result has, has gone our way or the way that, that maybe it deserves to go. But, but I've definitely seen huge signs of improvement. I, initially, you know, I mean, it was fine, wasn't he? You, you, you could see, you know... We, we joked about Emery Ball and the high press and playing out from the back and, and sweeping forward. And at, at times, you kind of got where, where he was coming from. But but they did lose direction. I do think that the players ended up looking and feeling quite confused about what they were being asked to do tactically. I, I think looking back at it, Unai Emery couldn't communicate well enough. And, and tactically, I think he got himself into a bit of a muddle, overthinking matches. Now, what's happened immediately is that the communication has got miles better. Mikel Arteta, as we know, has got great English, great grasp of, um, of of the way as well to talk to, to, to modern, you know, young players. He's, he's only just retired, hasn't he? So he, he gets it. He gets the Premier League. Um, he's worked with, obviously, a master in, in Pep Guardiola. So, so communication is great. I think that he simplified everything in terms of the me- the key messages, just stripped it back, made made everything simple for the players and and I think we can all see can't we that, that there's a there's a plan in place we can all we all have an idea of the type of football that he, he wants to play it's just at the moment I don't know if he's got the right players to to, to get the most out of that and, and maybe not the right right fitness levels as well and and and, and also and I would probably put this further back than in Emery I, I just feel that some of the players have I've had bad habits now for for a long, long time, and it takes a while to to sort of Absolutely. get some of those bad habits and and mentalities out, out of this system and to to start fresh. So, so look, yeah, so far for a rookie manager, I think he's doing a fabulous job. But but yeah, it's, it's way too early to to properly judge him. Agreed, agreed, and 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 you're absolutely right in all the things you say there. And I think for me. As someone, you know, I've been doing this for for quite a while now, but I've only been working as a full time journalist probably for less than a year now. Um, mm. You know, I took the jump. I wanted to do what I wanted to do, and I've, I've I'm happy to be in the position I am in now. Yeah. But I think as a, being being a fan during Unai Emery's tenure, I guess what I've really liked about Mikel Arteta is not just the communication between him and the squad, but the communication between him and the fans. I think as a fan, you can accept a lot more, and you can. Uh, support a lot more when you understand what the end goal is and you understand the reasons behind certain things whereas with Unai Emery it was it was guesswork a lot of the time we were trying to work out what he was trying to do and we were trying to understand what he meant by certain comments and that leaves room for speculation and it leaves room for misinterpretation and that can be a real problem so one of the things that I found really good about Arteta is the fact that his communication with the fans via press conferences interviews for me that's been brilliant yeah, we, we, I, I agree. I, on, on that, you, you can't fool the supporters. We 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 all watch you. We're all supporters. We all want them to do well. You 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 can't fool them. So now I think with Uno, he wasn't trying to fool anyone. He, it was just a communication. Agreed. Agreed. He, um, but with Mikel, what what I am liking is the honesty and and the reason I think I would love to have played under him at this point is that. He feels like the kind of manager that even if you've played well and you've beaten the opposition, he will say, yeah, yeah, that was good, that was good. But look, we can do this better, we can do this better, and we're striving to, to, to raise standards. So I, I think he's going to, he is going to improve the players. All he's got to do is, is hold his nerve. And this is, this is the problem with, with a lot of younger managers, I suppose, that are inexperienced. They, when the results maybe don't go your way, they, they, they then begin to change. And, and, and panic and move away from their sort of b- beliefs, I guess. And and I'm not saying that Mikel would do that. I th- I'm confident. In fact, I'm really confident he won't. But that's a mistake a lot of rookie managers make. Is when results go wrong, they panic. 
they go to something else and then that doesn't work and then they go to something else. So so I think with Mikel, he's really strong. It's my way. You have to abide by it. And I'm going to raise standards. Just just trust me. And and right now I do think the fans trust him and I think the players do as well. Yeah, I agree. And I think you're absolutely right in making that point about sort of younger managers. There's obviously that temptation, isn't it, to abandon the very principles that got you to where you are in the first place. And I agree with you. I don't think Mikel Arteta will will bend in any way. I think he, he knows what he wants. He's got a very clear vision. Was you surprised by the way Mikel Arteta sort of came into the job and, and sort of grabbed everybody by the scruff of the neck and made it very clear from the beginning that he had a set of non-negotiables, as he called them. Because I know he worked under Pep Guardiola, who, you know, is an incredible manager. And as far as footballing educations go, I don't think they get much better than that. But in terms of the way Mikel Arteta carries himself, I never saw that fire in him as a player, necessarily. But I see it now as a manager. Yeah, yeah, he's got that steely. You won't mess with him, would you? <laughs> he's a steely, steely character. Um, I interviewed him for the breakdown a few years ago when he was captain, and he was f- fascinating to talk to, but really serious. Um, you could tell that he was he was deadly serious about football, and and even then, it w- he had that driven sort of winners mentality that that shone through from when I when I spoke to him and. And look, I, th- I think that that has only intensified working with Pep, who's absolutely obsessed, isn't he, with with winning and, and developing. So yeah, no, I thought I thought he absolutely nailed it. The first press conference, I'll, be, I'll level with you. I didn't know if it was a job for a, a rookie manager because you know Arsenal weren't in a good place when he took over. Huge club, huge responsibility. It was a it's a gamble. It still is a gamble. But, but but everything that he's said and done and the way that he's behaved has, has sort of reassured me and I think I think loads of people as well. So yeah, his key messages were, were absolutely bang on, and and, and yeah, I, I think he continues to nail it in his assessment post match. That's where I'm getting at in terms of you can't fool the supporters. We know when it's been good and when it's been poor, and and he has I think struck the right chord. So and if he's doing that with us, I'd imagine he's he's certainly doing that with the players. And that's and that's a good thing because we, I, I do think, and and I don't know because I don't spend much time at the training ground at all, but but just from watching all these years closely, it does feel as if maybe the, the players have, have been a bit too relaxed at times and and they've not been held accountable for for poor performances strictly enough, and I and I think that they will from now on. Yeah, agreed, and. It sounds silly, but, you know, obviously after the Olympiacos defeat in the Europa League, which was really heartbreaking because for me, it was an opportunity to win a European trophy, but also to qualify for the Champions League, which we know financially has huge implications on this football club. So to see Mikel Arteta, because I was I had the pleasure of being in his post-match press conference and to sit there sort of in, in the press room and watch him come in with his head down and, and looking really angry and really disappointed by the result, in a weird way was refreshing to see that. It wasn't a manager, like you said, it's about the honesty. It wasn't a manager coming in and saying, oh, you know, we were the better team by a mile and we should have... He, he did make points as to why Arsenal should have won the game, but he was also visibly really disappointed. And as a fan... I think you want to know that your manager is feeling those emotions with you. And I'm not saying that other managers don't, but to see that displayed publicly, I think helps a lot of fans relate to you. And I think he's managed that relationship really, really well. Yeah. It's it's easy at the moment, though. That's what I'll say. I agree with you. But it's easy because he's not under any pressure, really. He's in that sort of, not honeymoon period, but but he's not fighting for his job. And I think when... When managers are under that real pressure, that's when they start to make excuses and and when uh, you know they start, try to defend themselves. So so he, it's a different situation. But no, you, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I wish I could have stayed for that. I had to catch my train, so I had to, I had to dart from the commentary box to to to, to Houston. So yeah, I was I was sad to miss that. And it it was a it was a really disappointing performance. We're, we're not going to get perfect performances all the time. This is a team in transition. A team that is is nowhere near the finished article, and on and on the day or on the night, they, 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 they it was a fairly poor performance, wasn't it? So, so yeah, we're we're going to have to take the take the rough with the smooth, and there'll, there'll be plenty of rough nights like that one once we get going, even. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I trust in Arteta, that's for sure. 
for sure. No doubt about that. And I'm fully in Mikel Arteta's camp. Um, in terms of the summer, um, you know, let's fast forward to the summer. We know that, like you said, it's a, a team in transition. We know that he maybe doesn't necessarily have the players that he would want um, to play his particular style of football. And we expect there to be some ins and outs. Now, in terms of the ins and outs, it's very difficult to predict individual names because you don't know what the transfer budget's going to be. You don't know what other moves are going to happen in the market that could create opportunities. But if you was to identify areas in the team that you feel Mikel Arteta is a little bit light in, in the sense of he doesn't have the personnel that he probably needs, what sort of areas do you look at and say, we need to improve there and we need to improve here? Yeah, it's, I'm sure that they're really busy sort of working this out for themselves at the moment. Um, right back, for sure. I, look, I love Hector Bellerin as a, as a character. He's a really important person to have around. He's a good player, but right now, right now he's not quite as good as he was pre-injury. He's still sort of battling his way there, and, and we hope that he will get there. But even even peak Bellerin is not a great defender. I think he's a really he's a good footballer. Um, but not an outstanding defender. So I, th- I think he needs competition um, at right back. I think we're sorted at left back now um, with, with Saka's emergence, which has been incredible, just brilliant. And, and with him and Tierney, um, I think we're sorted there. That's not an issue. Um, centre back clearly is, is, is a problem area. Um, need more pace. Athleticism, and, and especially if we're going to, if we are going to press properly, and I do, I do feel that Arsenal sort of hung back from that lately, in terms of the intense pressing, and, and the reason is they can't squeeze up as high as they want because they don't have the speed at centre half that, that they need. So it's definitely, an athletic central defender will, will, will surely come on board, and then. And then oh, I mean, it's a mid- tough one, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in midfield. I don't think we've replaced Ramsey, really. Um, so, so somebody, I think when you play with a lone striker, and it seems that Mikel Arteta wants to play with a lone striker, then it's so important to have players joining in from from deep. And and at the moment, with the way the team's set up, we kind of don't need that to happen um, because Aubameyang's coming in, isn't he, from the left or Martinelli? And, and and Pepe kind of sometimes does the same, but but I, I feel that when the ball's in wide areas, I want to see a central midfielder, jo- you know, joining in. Take that gamble, ball. isn't it? Yeah, exactly. D- distracting defenders. Um, obviously, you want someone that can finish. I, I played with David Platt. You won't remember him probably, but from back in the day, David Platt was the master at ghosting into the box of scoring goals. And Ramsey, I think, had that in his locker. And, and we don't really have someone like that now. So, so that's definitely a hole that needs filling. I, I think athleticism in general, if at the moment, Jacker and Ceballos are obviously in possession of the shirts, both really good passers, um, technically sound, obviously. But, but when play breaks down against the very elite, I don't... I don't think any of us really believe that 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 they're the that they've got that elite all roundness to their game, um, on the ball no problem, off it are they quick enough to cover those holes, and 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 to to produce the defending that we need. So so definitely athleticism throughout the midfield, probably uh, 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 yeah, progressive midfielder and someone that's technical but can also defend. Yeah, it's got those qualities and and. And beyond that, oh, it depends who leaves, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, hopefully, hopefully there aren't too many high-profile departures. I do think there will be changes. Um, but, but the way that Mikel plays, you've got to be looking at wingers. You've got to be looking at people that will, that will go around the outside and, um, and, and, and make the difference. So, so it's quite a, few, quite a few areas, I guess, um, to, to feel. None of us knows what's going to happen, obviously, with Meza Ozil, with, with Laka, with, with Aubameyang. So, you know, I hope, I hope they stay. But if they don't, then we'd obviously need to replace them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in terms of, you, you touched on wingers there and how important they are to, to Mikel Arteta's way of playing. And somebody who's divided opinion a lot this season, having come for a really big transfer fee in the yeah. summer, is Nicolas Pepe. Um, I watch Nicolas Pepe and I see, at times, 
flashes of his ability to beat people with ease. And sometimes I wonder why he doesn't go on the outside that little bit more. And I, and I always come to that thought of it's because he's left footed and he's playing on the right. And so naturally he always wants to come inside. And, you know, there have been players in history who have done that. I'll give you Iron Robin as a perfect mm-hmm. example of someone who's always done that, but it's always done it so effectively. And even though people know it's coming, they still can't prevent it. But I'd like to see Nicolas Pepe vary up a little bit. Am I being silly when I say I'd like to see him played on the other flank for a little while just to see if he can use that raw pace and that ability to go on the outside on his stronger foot to beat the fullback and then cut balls back for the forwards am I being silly in saying that or should I just be more patient oh silly Harry no of course not I'd never call you silly um, <laughs> you can if you want it's an open forum <laughs> it's look, it's something that he might try it's a, so I just feel that a lot of footballers look I, I was a winger that, that, that played on both sides I was primarily left footed but a lot of my first team appearances for Arsenal were on the right wing, actually. Um, but I could, I was comfortable going on the outside and using my right. Anyway. I wasn't so predominantly left footed as, as Pepe. Um, it's, a, it's something worth considering. Um, I think it's all about combinations, really. At the moment, we've got a s- seriously attacking left, left back. So the left winger doesn't need to do that because the left back does. Yeah. So, so you've got Martinelli or Aubameyang playing as a second striker from the left. On the right, the reason the balance isn't as good is because we can't push the full back on as much because of obvious reasons with Saka playing as a left winger practically and, and because of Pepe coming inside. So it is in balance. If Pepe was the type of player that went on the outside it, we, we would be flying right now. I agree. I think he should mix up his game more. I think his decision making absolutely can be better and more consistent and I want to see him combining more often with with Lacazette with whoever's playing as a as a striker I want to see those give and goes more often we've seen it a little bit more of late with Ozil and Pepe which is really encouraging we want to see more more of that but but yeah I, I think for, for the reasons you've identified Reese Nelson has to come into the mix as, a, as an option when we come back and 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 the fact that that's an option means I think that Mikel Arteta will, will have to look at uh, maybe a, a ready-made right winger that, that that will go on the outside just to give just to cover all bases because there may be a time where where that balance in the team changes and we and we need that real width on the right hand side. So no t- t- tough one. I, th- I think Pepe is definitely under underachieved given given his price tag. I don't think we can sugarcoat it. What all I'll say is, Arteta is supposed to be a brilliant coach, and I do believe he will improve players, can improve players. So I'm I'm sure that he's preaching what we want to Pepe on a daily basis. It's up to the player, isn't it, whether he wants to take that on board and, and learn. All I'll say is, if he isn't, if he won't produce the type of game that. That the, ben, that the head coach wants from him, then maybe he, he might be one of the ones that, that, that is sacrificed long term. I don't know. I'm just speculating. So I, I think that goes for everyone, actually. I think if you, if, if you don't play the way that, if you don't do the job that Mikel Arteta wants you to do or needs you to do, I, I don't think he will hold on to those players because of their names or fees. I think he'll move them on and he'll bring in people that, that are prepared to do that. Agreed, agreed. And another player you mentioned there, Adrian, who I'd love to get your thoughts on is Mesut Ozil. Because this has got to be the most divisive player that I've (laughs) ever known uh, in all my years of supporting Arsenal Football Club. I'm very much a Mesut Ozil fan. I appreciate what he brings to the team. I appreciate the positions he takes up and how they create uh, problems for the opponents when he pops up on the right and he comes up on the left. And, you know, how do you mark somebody like that? It's very difficult. I think at times we've been guilty of allowing Mesut Ozil to make those movements, but not necessarily picking him out. And I see that, and I guess that's my opinion, but where do you stand on the whole Mesut Ozil debate? Is he still offering something to this Arsenal team, in your opinion? Well, he's he's a much better, much more effective player in an Arteta team than he was in the team Emery left behind, and certainly the one that, that Freddie Lundberg picked, which never never included Ozil, did it, or hardly ever. Um, basically, 
to get the most out of Urzu, you need the team to be to, to be brave in possession, to make those forward passes between the lines. And and under Lundberg, that confidence has just gone. It had evaporated. And, and, and previously a bit under Emery as well. Under Arteta, there is more confidence. The fluency is not quite there. But once it once it does come, I think we'll see even more from Meza. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of his. I don't I don't like technically he's outstanding, isn't he? I, I like his movement. He is hardworking, even though people don't think that. Um, he moves around a great deal. Um, I think with the way Arteta plays it, with these sort of five lanes, I don't want to get too technical. But you, you've got the Saka. If you if you talk about a front five, you've got almost like a Saka, Bamiyang, Lacazette. Urzel and then Pepe in a in a front five really in that in that order, that's the best position for Urzel. He's always been at his best in the right channel, um, where he can chop back on his left and, and slip players in. Um, so yeah, I think he, I think he's still got plenty to offer. If he was earning a third of what he's earning. <laughs> I don't think there would be any too much quibbles really in terms of what from the fans. I think it's only the fact that you know the contract is what it is, and people are thinking, does he provide value for money for that? And look, it, it is what it is. Of course, we want to see him score more goals. We want to see him creating more assists, like he like he used to. But but we're looking at a player that, and we have to be honest with ourselves here. Mesut Ozil, peak Ozil has gone. He's not in, you know. He's not in his sort of prime anymore. We're looking at a, a player that's approaching the sort of almost veteran stage. So, so we have to understand that as well. I think so. Um, for the short term, absolutely, we we will rely on him. But but one of the big one of the big goals behind the scenes, I guess, will be right. Who can we get in the long term to to play that? that role for us because with with the talent around us and the pace in wide areas it is absolutely vital that we have the player that can slip those passes into the box they, the key moments as well that's that, that's why us was good as always delivered in key moments maybe not away from home but but he when you need a pass to be the perfect way i wouldn't trust anyone apart from him really to, to deliver that pass so so yeah in the short term still still a, still a really real mainstay yeah uh, but we've got to look to the future and, and and think right what do we want in that position when when he does leave that's the thing and and the thing that i find frustrating is you mentioned the salary there and and i get it i i totally get where people are coming from when they say is he providing value for money? Probably not. I, I, you know, you can argue that point and you'd have a very good argument. And I've got no issues with people having that view. I guess where I get frustrated is that at a time where we had both him and Alexis Sanchez and Alexis Sanchez had opted to join Manchester United, the club were in a bit of a, a difficult situation. Both of their contracts were running down, um, which is poor management in the first place. But that's another matter. Just imagine the uproar had Arsenal allowed Mesa Ozil to go at the same time that Alexis Sanchez went. And you can just imagine it now from the, the fan base, how they would have been crying out for, you know, the fact that the club have allowed this to happen and it's poor management and they don't want to spend the money, etc, etc. And maybe he hasn't performed to the level we'd have hoped since then. But yeah. it's easy to say that in hindsight, isn't it? Whereas at the time, we had two real key players, two really, really important players. We just lost one of them and we simply couldn't afford to lose the second. And maybe we've overpaid him uh, and maybe we're going to suffer for that. But I just feel like it's so easy to have a go at that in hindsight. But at yeah. the time, everyone was celebrating it. Well, it just, yeah, they were. Um, no, what's happened has happened. And, and I, I, I get the reasons why. you just got to ask yourself, who would you rather play in the? Who would you rather have in the team instead of Mesut Özil? Like, who is there that, that that to play that creative role? Now, people, some people might say, "Oh, push Danny Ceballos forward." I don't know. I, don't, I think the jury's out on that. Whether he would be as good, certainly not not better. I don't think than Özil in there. Would you want a front two, which would take Özil out of the equation? Now, all the evidence we've seen so far is that Mikel Arteta doesn't want a front two. Um, so, so I, I think we probably have to put that one to bed. Could Martinelli play there as a sort of youthful, energetic number ten that, that goes here, there, and everywhere? Maybe, but has he got that tactical awareness yet that that, that Meza has? No. So, could Pepe play there? 
possibly. I, I, that might, but that might be a role for him in the long term. But again, has he got that that in game intelligence? Because you have to be smart to play in that number ten role. You have to be clever with your movements. And, and the bottom line is this: Meza Özil only functions well, or will only function at his best in a team that plays fast football, that moves the ball between the lines quickly before opposition teams are set. And, and and we've seen it a few times of late where he's been brilliant. And 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 if Arsenal can get to that level again, I think we will see him have have more positive games than than negative. I really do. Um, but yeah, we know that he's not the future. But for now, I think he's in the best eleven. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Just what, one more player I wanted to ask you about, Adrian, before I throw a couple of listener questions at you. Um, is it is Ainsley Maitland-Niles and, and it's been quite clear that he's fallen out of favour at the Emirates Stadium lately we don't really know the, the ins and outs I mean people are speculating about his attitude and various other things but the, the reality is we're not on the training ground we don't know what's gone on but is it telling for you that Mikel Arteta and I know we spoke about the system and the fact that the right back doesn't push on as much but the fact that he's been selecting Socrates at right back does that kind of spell the end for Ainsley Maitland-Niles? Do you think he has a future at Arsenal in any other position? On paper, it's not great news, is it, <laughs> for, for Maitland-Niles? Yeah, look, I've read the same speculation as you. I, I don't know, is the bottom line. Um, if there's been a conversation where where the player has said, I don't want to play there, we'd, that might have happened. And if it has, then if I was the head coach, I, I would leave that player out as well. Um, because you want people to, to be on board for the team. Um, but that's just speculation. I, I really don't know. I think, I, to, I think I was performance wise, I was beginning to see real improvements in Maitland. I was at right back under Arteta. I thought he, I thought he kind of got, got it and it was actually suiting, suiting his, his style of play, the Arteta way. So it is a real shame. Um, hand on heart. I don't know if he's good enough to be a central midfielder for Arsenal. I don't know. Um, he's had not had many opportunities. Um, the, the ones that he has, I don't think he's fully grasped it in that position. So, so look, if, if I'm Ainsley, I'm thinking right back is my best chance of getting a game. Um, so, and, and I still think that with with Bayer in with 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 Socrates as well. He's got a good chance of playing. Um, but yeah, he's got to deliver for the manager. And if his attitude isn't right, and I don't, you know, I, I wouldn't want to say that it isn't. If it isn't right, then then he won't play. Um, we'll find out, won't we? We'll find out with the players that, that Arsenal look to look to sell and move on. He is at a crucial age. I, I myself was at that age where you're not really, a, you're not a regular anymore. You're on the fringe. And the man, you know, Arsene Wenger said to me, "Look, I can't. You're not really in my plans. I can't. I, I can't guarantee you games. It might be better for your career to to to, to be a first choice elsewhere." I think we're getting to that point, maybe with with Maitland Niles. Um, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, that that's my view as well. Is that it's not personal. It's just maybe. If he's not willing to to play in that position, then I can't see him getting in anywhere else. Person. Yeah, it's never personal. Yeah. Look, look at Granit Xhaka. I mean, he had a big fallout and he got back in because he showed the right attitude. No one's held it against him. Uh, you just got to be a pro, haven't you? If if you're earning your money by delivering, then the manager's happy, supporters are happy. No, no problem. It, unfortunately, to stay at Arsenal, and I know this because it, it absolutely killed me back in the day, to stay there, you have to be really, really good. And, and sometimes that's not even enough. You have to be really, really mentally strong to handle the pressure and the expectations. And beyond that, you have to be really, really consistent because you can't carry prisoners. If you play for Arsenal, you, you can't go on poor runs. It's not acceptable. So, so there's so many factors and reasons why players don't stay. And yeah, and if we want Arsenal to be a, a top level club, you've got to drive those standards. You've got to maintain those standards, haven't you? You can't afford to carry people um, and that applies to everyone absolutely it applies to the superstar players as well if they're not delivering then you, you have to make difficult decisions absolutely it's come to that point in the show where I'm going to throw a couple of listener questions at you Adrian um, these have come through via Twitter over the last couple of days the first one comes from Joe 
Joe429 is his Twitter name. It's just Joe uh, as his uh, display name. He says, in the event that Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang was to leave the club this summer, who would you select as Arsenal's captain moving forward? (laughs) Oh, that's a killer. That's, really that's why killer. I've thrown it at you. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, I mean, if, if yeah, if he was to go, who would be captain? Well, the thing, the thing is, I think it'd have to be a first-choice player because I, I think we've we've had enough, haven't we, of, of captains at Arsenal that, that don't play. I mean, it's been such a poison chalice, hasn't it, in, in recent times? Um just go through this. I, it's not a question I'd really thought of. Um, I, my initial choice might have been Lacazette, actually. Um, now, you could probably put a, a big question mark over his his future and, and whether he plays regularly either. But, but I've always liked Lacazette's sort of fight and spirit and character. I think he's a, he's a leader. Um, Salt a little bit, maybe. His body language has not been quite as good of late. But um, Lacazette would have been... A candidate. I'm, I'm padding here, aren't I? I mean, I mean, <laughs> there's not. There's not. The, the, unfortunately, there aren't any standout contenders, are there? Let me um, let me ask you this then: If Granit Xhaka hadn't done what he'd done earlier in the season, and that situation hadn't happened, yeah. hadn't developed, and hadn't blown up the way it did, would you consider him? Given he starts pretty much every game. Yeah, but it, yeah, if if it hadn't happened, the, the problem is it did happen, and. And as much as we forgive and, 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 and we move on, I think going back to him as captain is probably is probably not something they can they can do uh, really. Um, no. So uh, do you know what? I, I, the, if Aubameyang goes, it may be, and I wouldn't be against this. We've seen it kind of at Manchester United with Harry Maguire, a new signing. I, yeah. I absolutely wouldn't have a problem with a new signing coming in if it's an inspirational central defender or central midfield player, if they've got the right character and that they're used to wearing the armband, they could easily turn out to be the, the, the next captain of the team. So, so yeah, it's, um, it's, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to Joe that I haven't, I, I've been so <laughs> flaky with, with this. I think that Lacazette is, a, is, is captain material. I think Bayerin is captain material, but are they, are they regulars? Are they, are they, fixtures uh, you know David Luiz I suppose is captain material I think he's a he's a good character uh, definitely got leadership qualities David Luiz in the short term maybe he would step up but but again you would have to ask is he going to be a, a first choice in the, in the long term so yeah sorry <laughs> uses everyone else next <laughs> like doesn't leave that's that's fine it's a really difficult question it's a great question so thank you to joe for for sending that in but it is a really really difficult one as well um this next one comes from michael o'connor he asks has matteo genduzzi been grounded after a really confident start to his arsenal career has he now been cast aside by Mikel arteta and is this a learning curve for the young frenchman I hope he's not being grounded because I think there's a lot to like about him. I really do. Um, and I thought in the Portsmouth game in the FA Cup, he he showed incredible discipline. I don't know if you saw the breakdown that I did. Like I think I, we, we highlighted his touch map, and and he, it was almost all in the central part of the pitch. He'd curbed that that habit of chasing here, there, and everywhere to the left, to the right, and which I think w- was not the right thing for him to do. So I think he's getting it in terms of Arteta's style and what he needs. He's got fight, hasn't he? He's got he's got a real spirit, Matteo Guendouzi. I think he's definitely a player worth persisting with. How, whether he's got the quality to be an Arsenal regular if we're a Champions League team, then you you, you maybe say, well, maybe not. Maybe he's the sort that would have to be on the bench that you develop over over time. But I wouldn't cast him aside unless, and again, this is pure speculate, unless there's some kind of disruption behind the scenes. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. Because if I'm a manager as well, I, you can't tolerate bad apples. You can't have it. And, and, and if there are any individuals causing problems that, that are affecting the team, then you have to move them on. But I haven't heard anything bad about, about Gwen Doozy. Um, so no, but based on purely on what we see, definitely stick with him and develop him and coach him and and yeah I think for his age he's done some great things already 
Yeah, he, he has. He absolutely has. I think he's been a bit unfortunate in the sense that, well, not unfortunate because in a way it's benefited him that he's been given so much experience at such an early age and he's been given that exposure and he's learnt. But at the same time, I felt like under Unai Emery in particular, he was really heavily relied upon. Mm. And maybe that burden on his shoulders wasn't helpful for such a young man finding his way at a big club in a big league compared to where he was playing before. So maybe, you know, that, that hasn't helped him. And we have to take that into account as well. This yeah, fun- Sorry, go ahead. Friends, by the way, sorry, sorry to interject. No, go ahead. In matches where we need a lift, where it's flat, where the energy, the, the tempo is not there. And, and you need someone to drive the team on. I, I couldn't think of anyone better to put on. I really couldn't. I, I think he's got that naturally in his makeup. So, so for me right now, he's, he's, he, he would be on my bench every week um, in case we needed that, that type of player. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right to highlight that because there's two games or two halves of football that stick in my mind in particular when you when you say that. And that's, I think it was against Aston Villa and against mm-hmm. Spurs. In the second half of both of those games this season, he came on and made a huge difference to the energy. Um, I can't remember if he started those games or if he came on as a sub, but there was in particular halves, I think the second halves of those games, he was immense and the energy and the pressing and the whole you know urgency that the team were maybe lacking he brought that to the table and he deserved huge credit for that final question comes from luke jones who listens to us all the way from california where i'm sure the weather is much better than it is here at the moment um so big hello to luke he asks and this is the most difficult question adrian that's why i've left it till last he asks if you had to rate Mikel arteta's performance as the arsenal head coach up until now what would you give him out of 10? Ah, it's not that hard. <laughs> I think it's good. I think it's quite easy, actually, because I would rate it 8 out of 10. Um, very good. Um, yeah, it's not outstanding because if we'd have gone on a winning streak, that would have been outstanding. But to, to make us much tougher to beat was no mean feat, given where we were, and especially away from home where, where we were leaking goals for fun um, just look at the you know the chances the team were conceding and, and the chances they're, ne- they're now conceding okay we're still conceding too many I, I mean I looked at it um, not so long ago I think almost 200 more shots Burnt Leno has had to face than Man City's keepers this year it's, it's mad um, so, so there's a lot to work on um, but I do feel we're a bit tighter I do think we're better organised um, I like the the fluency of the movement. I like the, the I like the Xhaka Saka Ober sort of axis. Yeah, I like it. It's quite fluent, isn't it? It's a bit different, and it's causing teams problems. That's just one thing. I think over time we'll see other little nuances come into play. Um, he's got the team together. They definitely seem a happier dressing room. Um, his team selections. I think, by and large, I agree with. It. Obviously, we all have our own opinions. We wouldn't always pick the same same teams, but but yeah, I I really can't find too much to to criticise from Arteta yet, other than we don't really have a plan B. Um, but but you've got to get that plan A better, haven't you? You've got to develop the plan A. Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm sure he will work on a on on an alternative. Um, system, an alternative method when things aren't going so well, something to change things up, maybe a change, a change of shape. I think I'd like uh, Unai Emery probably did it too much, didn't he? But what I'd like, I think the missing thing so far is if, like the Olympiacos game, maybe where it's not going our way, um, Sheffield United is another one where, where Sheffield United changed their, their shape, suddenly it transformed the game they came at us. You're looking at Mikel, what have you got? Have you got something to combat that? He didn't really act. If he if he can develop that plan B, something um, where the players are comfortable in that's that's different to plan A, then then you know then it's starting to get to a nine nine out of ten category. But yeah, so far so good. Definitely a solid eight. Definitely, yeah, I agree with that, and I think. The in-game management stuff, I think that will come. I think it's it's still really early days in his managerial career, isn't it? New, isn't it? I mean, just... never. I mean, you watched him at City, never got off his seat. Did he really? He he was always in the ear of Pep. He was giving advice, but when you're the guy 
that has to stand there yeah. and think while you're watching the game. It's hard. It's really hard, especially from ground level. So he's definitely, I think we can all forgive him if he's not quite as decisive maybe as, as some more experienced managers might be. Um, I think we've seen that with his subs, haven't we? Quite cautious. Mm -hmm. Doesn't tend to make rash changes. I think as he gets more confident in his own decision-making ability, we'll see more decisiveness from him for sure. Absolutely. Adrian, thank you so much for your time today. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. And, you know, we've, we've taken more of your time than we initially scheduled as well. So massive thank you to you for providing so much insight, some great opinions, some great analysis. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Somebody whose breakdowns I look forward to every week and somebody whose opinion I really respect. So it was a real pleasure having you on the podcast and we hope to speak to you again soon sometime. Yeah, no, uh, no, pleasure to speak to you, Harry. Yeah, no, great questions from everybody. And yeah, look, yeah, it's, yeah, we just got to stick, we've got to stay strong, haven't we, together? We've got to ride this, this, this crisis out and, and hopefully the football will be back sooner rather than later. And, and yeah, we can, we can get on with having, having the fun and, and the ups and downs of following, following Arsenal. So no, no, it's been good to talk football uh, and to, to sort of, yeah, just get back into that mode rather than worrying about what's going on in the world. So, yeah, thanks for having me on, mate. Almost therapeutic, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, mate. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up soon. Yeah, no worries.